Hi, this is the Mosomic MEMS microphone guide. In this episode we'll talk about the acoustics inside a MEMS microphone. They have a great effect on the performance and the functionality of the component. We'll talk about things like the typical structure of a microphone, the key acoustic factors inside a microphone, Helmholtz resonances and acoustic resistances. Stay tuned! This series is sponsored by Infineon Technologies. Hi, I'm Mikko Sumanto from Masomic. A typical MEMS microphone, and also an electric condenser microphone, is built into a housing, a package, that uh, on one hand is an acoustical enclosure, for the sensor, and it also protects the sensor from outside elements. The shape, size and structure of the housing can vary significantly. A typical package for a MEMS microphone is a roughly rectangular box that's made out of circuit board material and possibly a metal lid. The Infineon microphone that we see here in the picture is a good example of that. Capacitive microphones are the most common type of miniature microphones. The acoustic sensor of a capacitive microphone is formed out of two parallel plates that also form an electrical capacitor. The oscillation of one of the plates, often called the membrane, causes the electrical capacitance to oscillate as well. The varying capacitance can be transformed into an output signal, either voltage or current. There are also piezoelectric MEMS microphone sensors. The sound pressure waves bend the piezoelectric material and that induces a voltage that can be turned into the output of the microphone. Let's have a look at the key building blocks of a capacitive microphone. We'll go into a lot more detail later. Let's go through the parts highlighted in the drawing here. Number one is the package enclosure, the housing. Number two is the sound port, the acoustic opening in the package, through which sound enters the package. Number three in the drawing is the compliant membrane that oscillates along with the incoming sound pressure waves. Number four is the rigid perforated backplate that forms an electrical capacitor together with the membrane. Without the perforations, air could not move through the backplate and membrane movement would be dampened significantly because of the air trapped between the two plates. Number five is the front volume. It's the volume of air between the sound port and the membrane. Number six is the back volume. It's the volume of air inside the package behind the membrane. There are variations of this basic structure. For example, the back plate can actually be a front plate, meaning that it's closer to the sound port, or there can be two back plates, one on each side of the membrane. The exact structure of the membrane and the back plate can vary a lot. For example, in traditional electric condenser microphones, the membrane is typically a, a plastic foil covered with metal coating and that's of course very different from modern MEMS microphones made in semiconductor processes. Let's take a closer look at the key acoustic factors in a miniature microphone. We'll start with the sound port dimensions. The key properties of the sound port are its size, in practice the diameter or area of the port, and its length, if it has a discernible length. The number of sound ports, if there are more than one, is important also because this affects the total sound port area. The dimensions of the sound port must be chosen carefully because they affect how different sound frequencies are able to enter the microphone. This is closely related to the size of the front volume that we'll talk about next. However, in many cases, the size of the sound port is limited by factors external to the microphone that are not in the hands of the microphone designer, so the design ends up being a compromise. Second, we have the size of the front volume. This is the amount of air between the sound port and the membrane. The size of the front volume is an important factor because it's likely to be a part of a Helmholtz resonator together with the sound port and the acoustic channel built into the device mechanics. A rule of thumb is the smaller, the better. We'll talk more about this in a minute. The third key acoustic factor is the membrane. The membrane has many acoustic properties that affect the performance of the microphone. 
Its size determines the area that is affected by the sound waves. This affects the sensitivity of the microphone. Its stiffness or compliance affects how easily sound can move the membrane. This affects the sensitivity and frequency balance of the membrane. The mass of the membrane affects how easily it reacts to the subtleties of the incoming sound waves. The lighter the better, as long as the robustness of the membrane isn't compromised. Also the sizes, shapes and quantity of acoustic vent openings in the membrane for back volume pressure equalization affect the performance of the microphone. The suspension method of the membrane, the way it's attached to the surrounding mechanics or silicon bulk material, determines how the membrane moves. It can move like a drum head, meaning that mainly the center of the membrane moves and the edges remain stationary. Due to the fact that the edges don't move, or move very little, the effective area of the membrane is smaller. This affects the sensitivity of the membrane. The membrane can also move back and forth as a rigid object, like a piston. Flexible mounting, in practice some sort of springs, lets also the edges of the membrane move. A 100% piston-like movement is not practically possible to achieve, so the movement ends up being a combination of a piston and a drum head. The way the membrane moves affects how efficiently and accurately it can sense the sound waves. For example, if the whole membrane moves, the mass is of course higher than in the case where the edges of the membrane remain stationary. The next key acoustic factor is the gap between the membrane and the backplate. This is the perpendicular distance between the two plates when they are at rest. As we'll discuss later in detail, the gap affects, for example, the noise performance and sensitivity of the microphone. Next up is the backplate and the perforations in it. The perforations are there to allow air to pass through the backplate. Otherwise, air would be trapped between the membrane and the backplate, acting as a spring, impeding the movement of the membrane. The number of holes and the hole pitch, meaning the distance between holes, play significant roles as acoustic factors. Hole sizes and lengths also affect the performance of the microphone. The lengths of the holes are naturally dependent on the thickness of the backplate. Even the shapes of the holes can affect the microphone's performance. Together with the membrane backplate gap, backplate perforations affect the shelf noise of the microphone significantly. Key acoustic factor number six is the size of the back volume. It has a significant effect on the sensitivity and frequency response of the microphone, and thereby also on other parameters such as signal-to-noise ratio. We'll talk more about how these factors affect the performance and the characteristics of the microphone next. As I mentioned, the sound port and the front volume form a Helmholtz resonator. We talked about Helmholtz resonance in more detail in episode 2. The phenomenon can be more pronounced when the microphone is implemented into the acoustic porting of a device because more tubes and or cavities are added to the acoustic system. A disturbing Helmholtz resonance can be avoided by minimizing the size of the front volume and maximizing the size area in practice of the sound port. As I mentioned earlier, sometimes the size of the sound port is set by external factors, such as industry standard mechanical specifications, so the only thing the microphone designer can affect is the size of the front volume. Minimizing the size of the front volume has several benefits for the microphone and the whole microphone system. It improves the frequency response and frequency balance of the microphone. The Helmholtz resonance is moved to a higher frequency or eliminated. Minimizing or eliminating the front volume improves the microphone system performance, especially if the design of the device sound channel is compromised, like it usually is. We'll talk more about this in the episode about microphone implementation. The back volume is an acoustically sealed enclosure inside the package of the microphone behind the membrane. The enclosure acts like an air spring that resists the movement of the membrane. To minimize the resisting spring force, the air volume should be as big as possible. Maximizing the back volume improves the sensitivity, SNR and frequency response of the microphone. There's a tiny little vent hole in the membrane structure. It allows the pressure in the back volume to equalize with the ambient air pressure. 
Equalizing the pressure enables avoiding over or under pressure in the back volume. An over or under pressure would stretch the membrane towards the sound port or towards the back volume. This would affect the functionality and performance of the microphone. The vent hole can affect the frequency response of the microphone, especially at low frequencies, which can be attenuated. The effect depends on the size and the design of the, of the hole in the membrane. In some cases the hole is not through the membrane, but uh, somehow next to the membrane. This is uh, the case, for example, in microphones where the membrane is spring-mounted, and there are leaks through the springs that act as the vent holes. A key phenomenon related to miniature microphones is that uh, small gaps and slits act as acoustic resistances to sound traveling through them. In a MEMS microphone, the gap between the membrane and the backplate is an acoustic resistance, and so are the holes through the backplate. When the membrane moves, it pushes and pulls air through the gap between the membrane and the backplate, and through the holes in the backplate. This movement of air through the acoustical resistances is equivalent to current flowing through electrical resistors. The result is noise. In a miniature microphone, the acoustic resistances can be significant noise sources, increasing the noise level of the whole component. A gap that's narrow and or long causes a big acoustic resistance. To minimize noise, one should maximize the cross-sectional areas of all gaps through which air moves. The key passages are the gap between the membrane and the backplate, and the holes in the backplate. The gaps and passages that form the acoustic resistances should be as short as possible. The distance air has to travel between the membrane and the backplate should be minimized by minimizing the hole pitch, the distance from one hole to the next one in the backplate. Minimizing backplate thickness reduces the length of the holes through it. Maximizing the gap between the membrane and the backplate helps reduce noise, but at the same time it decreases the capacitance of the sensor. The capacitance affects, for example, the sensitivity of the microphone sensor. For maximized capacitance, the gap should be as small as possible. In practice, the gap height is typically a compromise between noise and sensitivity. Maximizing the backplate hole sizes also compromises the capacitance, because it reduces the amount of backplate material. Therefore, the backplate hole size is also a compromise between noise and sensitivity. Okay, there's one more thing to talk about the microphone package. If there's a sound port also in the back of the microphone, behind the membrane, it enables sound to affect the membrane from both sides. The pushing and pulling forces of the sound waves entering from the front and the back are often opposite, depending on the direction and frequency of the incoming sound. The forces get summed at the membrane, and the result is that the microphone responds differently to sound depending on the direction the sound is coming from. In other words, the microphone is now directional. Directional MEMS microphone capsules are not commercially available due to some drawbacks related to the acoustics and uh, reliability of such a structure. We'll talk more about this in another episode. Okay, that's all for this episode. In this one we talked about how the acoustic structure of the microphone has a big impact on the performance and uh, characteristics of the component. We covered things like uh, the acoustic structure of the component, Helmholtz resonance, and acoustic resistances. In episode 4, we'll go into the factors that determine the value of a MEMS microphone, such as performance, accuracy, stability, as well as robustness and reliability. I hope I'll see you around. Cheers! If you have any questions or comments, write them down in the comments below, and I'll do my best to answer them. You can also contact me online or on social media. If you liked what you saw here, give a like for the video and subscribe to the Mosomic channel. That way you help me reach more people and thereby create more content. If you need more in-depth microphone training than what you saw here, contact me and we can arrange it. The training can be adapted to suit any interests and skill levels, and the customer can choose the location and duration of the course. 
Mosomic provides also consultation services in all things related to MEMS microphones. If you're a microphone buyer, I can help you select the right components for your product and manage your microphone suppliers. I can also assist in implementing the microphones into your device. For microphone manufacturers, I provide microphone marketing, product definition, product management and development management services. I can also help you create all kinds of MEMS microphone documentation, 